Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Otolaryngologic Clinics podcast. I'm Stacey Eastman, the managing editor for the series here at Elsevier. Otolaryngologic Clinics is a bi-monthly publication consisting of review articles focused on a central topic. Today, we will be discussing the April 2021 issue dedicated to head and neck cutaneous cancer. Guests edited by Dr. Cecilia Schmalbach and Kelly Malloy. Here now is the consulting editor, Dr. Shujana Chandrasekhar, to lead the discussion. Hello, I'm Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar. I'm the consulting editor for Otolaryngologic Clinics of North America. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with the two guest editors of the April 2021 issue on head and neck cutaneous cancer, Dr. Cecilia Schmalbach and Dr. Kelly Malloy. Dr. Schmalbach is the David Myers MD Professor and Chair of the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University and Director of the Head and Neck Institute at Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She is also the Editor-in-Chief-Elect of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, which is the Journal of the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. Dr. Malloy is Associate Professor of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at the University of Michigan Medical School and Program Director of the Head and Neck Surgical Oncology and Microvascular Reconstruction Fellowship and Associate Chief Clinical Officer of Surgical and Rehabilitative Services at University Hospital Michigan Medicine in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Welcome to you both, Cecilia and Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. So I am so happy to talk to the two of you, um, absolute experts in this area, but also um, compassionate and ethical physicians who can understand all that it means to have a disfiguring lesion of the head and neck and what we should do to maximize the patient's quality and quantity of life um, with their treatment. So, you know, we've discussed uh, amongst ourselves, and of course you point out in the clinics that cutaneous or skin cancer rates are increasing in epic proportions, and they affect all ages, especially the elderly. Um, You know, back in the day, uh, people didn't put on sunblock, they actually put on oils and things to tan more or to invite more uh, sun damage into their skin, and the, you know those uh, those mistakes are coming home to roost right now. Yes, we see it in the elderly, but we also see it in younger people. And I think the way you've both assembled these fifteen articles and their authors covers the subject of skin cancer in the head and neck in its entirety, and brings a diversity of experiences and opinions to the science that you cover in this issue. So let's share some highlights from each of the articles. Let's start with the first one, which is Epidemiology and Prevention of Cutaneous Cancer, written by Drs. O'Leary and Wang. And Cecilia, Dr. Schmalbach, I'll address this question to you. Um, Non-melanoma skin cancer is the most common malignancy in the United States. So what preventative measures are we advocating for our patients? Sure. So I'll just begin for the audience defining non-melanoma skin cancer. It's a really large category, actually with over 80 histologic subtypes. Thankfully, the majority are basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and then Merkel cell carcinoma. Um, I really appreciate you allowing us to do this issue because it really, when you look at the um, manner in which skin cancer has become an epidemic in our country. Um, It is an economic health care burden and one that um, having prevention and getting awareness just becomes so important. So I appreciate this platform. Um, I think it's important to recognize that the cause of the non-melanoma skin cancers, in particular basal cell and cutaneous squamous cell, is that cumulative years in the sun that you just described. And it's specifically the ultraviolet radiation. And the World Health Organization actually defines ultraviolet radiation as a carcinogen. So think of that as no different than asbestos or tobacco. And actually it's recognized um, that tanning booths 
also um, lead to that uh, cancer causing exposure. And in fact, in some countries such as Brazil, um, Australia, New South Wales, it's actually outlawed altogether. Kind of a sobering statistic is that your risk of developing non-melanoma skin cancer in a tanning booth exceeds your risk of developing lung cancer if you smoke. Um, and so with that, it all comes to prevention of that exposure to ultraviolet radiation. So avoiding tanning booths altogether, avoiding the peak hours of the sun. So that's from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, if you are out in the sun seeking shade during that time, there are some great uh, clothing lines now that have specific ultraviolet protection. Um, going back to if you look at pictures from the 1950s and 40s, people wore long sleeve shirts and long sleeve pants. And so having coverage, thinking about that long, um, the brim, large brimmed hat. And then lastly, the use of sunscreen. And there, um, I will just acknowledge the the literature can be a little bit controversial. And I think it's because um, there aren't standardized studies looking at the SPF. Um, and so if you go to our colleagues from the American Dermatology Association, they advocate using an SPF of 30 or above. Keep in mind that sunscreens actually aren't waterproof, so you will need to reapply every 40 to 80 minutes. And they say that a shot glass of sunscreen is enough to cover the whole body. So those are some of the preventative measures that, that we can all take. So you're not supposed to drink the shot glass right. of sunscreen, right? You just exactly. kind of slather it. Okay, got it. You know, it's very interesting. You and I were talking about it because, you know, like the good nerds that we are, when we get together, we talk about a variety of things, including the importance of sunscreen. Um, and you had said your dream is that every ballpark you go to, every event you go to, there's just sunscreen there. And I thought, oh, that's a terrific idea. That's a great idea. And then I happened to be in Boston shortly thereafter. And lo and behold, in the outdoor play area outside the Children's Museum in Boston, there are free sunscreen dispensers, just like you'd get, you know, your hand sanitizer dispensed. And I, you know, I was so excited. I think it's the only picture of the trip to Boston that I actually sent you. And I was like, look what I found here. So I think um, raising awareness uh, in society by helping our colleagues by, by doing a clinics like this or by doing a podcast like this, but also by helping the public understand the reason that the statistic you said about the increased risk of skin cancer from normal tanning bed use being higher than the risk of getting lung cancer from smoking is really quite sobering. Um, so as we move forward, you had mentioned, uh, Cecilia, that there were different biological types of cancer. So Kelly, Dr. Malloy, let me talk to you about the article by Drs. Kandelwal, Echanik, St. John, and Nathan on cutaneous cancer biology. So the science behind cutaneous malignancies is crucial to understanding the risk and the potential treatment developments, especially as we're going to talk later on about certain biological uh, agents, et cetera. So uh, what can you share to uh, share with us about the genetic risks of cutaneous malignancies? And what is the science showing us today about potential future targets for therapy? Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, this is an area that I've learned a lot from this chapter. It's really dense, but it's beautifully laid out describing the mutational pathways um, in this complex and diverse set of malignancies. And it's pretty interesting that it appears that we know more in some areas like basal cell carcinoma and melanoma than we do right now about cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, for example. So this chapter really dives into the knowns and unknowns, things that I think we can hang our hat on right now but also things that um, are interesting and that might help us think about how we're, what, what we don't know and how we might advise patients in the meantime until there's more scientific discoveries. So a couple of examples about this. Um, one of the things that I learned was that um, about 90% of cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas show this loss of function um, in our guardian of the genome gene, uh, TP53. And it's this, that this is induced by the UV radiation that Cecilia was just talking about. And 
what happens is that you lose hetero heterozygosity um, at this gene, and that increases the mutational burden within these tumors and really kind of lets the tumor start to um, develop more rapidly. And what's pretty cool about this is while this is discovered in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, we actually already see this happening in oral cavity squamous cell carcinoma, another sort of bread and butter element of our work as head and neck surgeons. And they know a little bit more about this in oral cavity right now, where um, it looks like this um, PP53 mutation independently predicts poor um, disease specific survival. Now we don't know that yet on the cutaneous side, but it does raise this question about whether or not this is something that is going to be a poor prognostic indicator for our patients on the cutaneous side of squamous cell carcinoma. Another really neat thing I think for us to think about when we're talking to our melanoma patients is the realization that five to 10% of uh, melanoma is familial. It's autos autosomal dominant inheritance, but um, has incomplete penetrance. So when your patient's in the examining chair and says, you know, I, I remember that my grandfather may have had um, melanoma or a distant, you know, relative, a cousin, you know, thinking to yourself, well, is that really related or not? You know, there, there are studies that we can do and we can send these patients and their families to consider genetic testing uh, for things like CDKN2A and CDK4 um, genes. And this would allow these families to think more broadly about their melanoma risk, about mitigation strategies, and um, increase their surveillance through earlier follow-up, um, earlier exams with dermatologists, and, and different things that they can do to help um, catch these potential lesions early in life. So um, the last these, thing that I would share, oh, you were going to say? I, I was just going to say, are these... Um tests available to people outside of a research facility? Like can normal people in a normal interaction with healthcare have their tumors sent for these type of uh, genetic testing? So for the melanoma patients, we will send them to genetic counselors who will start that process and go through what is available in different, you know, labs, et cetera, in order to determine these risks. The risks on the, um, the tumor perspective are still things that are largely within the realm of, um, you know, research and us trying to figure out what are the predictors. And then I think the final um, interesting and critical part about this uh, chapter and what we can learn here is that, you know, when you're looking at these pathways and where we can interrupt them um, with potential treatments, we have a lot of really exciting evidence now, um, you know, in basal cell carcinoma, the hedgehog pathway has been defined, and we are already seeing the benefits of hedgehog inhibitors for these patients like uh, vismotogen. Um, and we'll talk quite a bit about how the melanoma pathways have been um, exploited, really, to improve survival for our patients. But I think the other neat thing about this um, chapter is that it really delves into the unknowns and speculates a little bit, defining some of the um, EGFR and FGFR uh, pathways and talking about what might uh, be coming up um, in the near future in terms of targeted therapies that might intervene. Um, some of those therapies exist now, some of them are being developed, and it's pretty exciting to know the science and be able to uh, look at it for possible um, therapeutics for our patients uh, in the near future. Thank you. You know, it, it strikes me the more I talk to other physicians who do a lot of cancer care, whether it be in the head and neck, whether it be cutaneous, mucosal, whether it be in other parts of the body, I think that this um, personalization of care, looking at cell biology, looking at genetics, looking at really interesting um, ways that we can target treatment for the individual person, as opposed to lumping everybody into this series of um, chemotherapeutics or that series of surgeries um, is really, uh, extraordinary. And I think this is a change that we've seen over the course of, you know, just our practices, which is really nice. Um, you know, let's go on and talk about advanced basal cell carcinoma. So basal cell carcinoma is the most common skin malignancy worldwide. And usually it's, you know, a little lesion here and there, the dermatologist has removed it and and, you know, everyone's hunky-dory. 
But sometimes you get these advanced basal cell malignancies. And this chapter was written by um, Dr. Monroe and uh, Dr. Kakarla. And so Cecilia, um, let's talk about the difference between like the run of the mill, indolent, almost benign acting basal cell, and then these subset of patients who really have advanced and aggressive disease. How do we identify them? And then what do we do to help them? Sure. So as you said, the majority will be um, indolent and for a otolaryngologist won't even make it to our clinic because those patients are treated very successfully by our primary care colleagues, which is fantastic. Um, the patients that we need to be concerned about uh, that we need to think about a bit more of an aggressive treatment and closer follow-up are, are what's truly deemed a high-risk category. So in basal cell carcinoma, the staging system is a bit different, and they're actually divided into low-risk and high-risk. So examples of high-risk patients would be your immunosuppressed patients that we'll talk quite a bit more about later on. It would be the patient that's already failed standard treatment and they've developed a recurrence, for example, especially if it's in the setting of irradiation. We do recognize at the histologic level, there are some um, uh, forms of basal cell carcinoma that are going to be more infiltrative and aggressive. So they include the micronodular subtype infiltrative pattern, sclerosing pattern, or morpheiform. So that's where you really can lean on your dermatopathologist and that report to help guide you. Um, we know that uh, if there's evidence of perineural invasion and perivascular um, invasion, similar to mucosal disease, those can uh, also be more aggressive. And then lastly, it actually is impacted by wear on the face the basal cell arises. So we often talk about the H zone or the mask region. So the perioral, um, periocular, uh, nasal region and ears, those can be higher risk as well. So that's your high risk group. And then you asked about, well, what do we do for treatment in these patients? And I think some really important takeaways that were nicely outlined in this chapter are that you know, for your high risk surgery remains the standard of care, and then possibly adjuvant radiation, depending on final pathology. Um, you opened up by talking about um, just compassion and quality of life. We recognize some basal cells can be so significant that to resect it functionally or socially would be just devastating. In those patients, primary radiation um, could be utilized as a uh, an alternative. Um, um, and certainly there's good long-term control, not quite as good as surgery. And then lastly, um, Kelly teed this up nicely. We recognize for those patients that have failed surgery uh, with or without radiation, those patients that simply are not a candidate, they're elderly and frail and can't have surgery or radiation. Now there's the ability to use the hedgehog inhibitor. Um, it was initially FDA approved in 2012. It's actually an oral pill that's given. And depending on your institution, it likely is prescribed either by medical oncology or dermatology. Um, most patients do tolerate it quite well, although they often will need a drug holiday within three months time because of significant out, uh, arthralgias and muscle pains, et cetera. And so the hedgehog inhibitor definitely has been great. Um, it's important to recognize it is end of the line, though. It's when all other treatment options have failed. It should not be the first drug of choice off the shelf. Um, so think about, again, those patients that have failed surgery and radiation or aren't candidates. And then lastly, the most recent uh, approval, and we'll talk more about this as well, are the PD-1 programmed F1 inhibitors, specifically simiplumab. And for advanced basal cell carcinoma, I think it's really important for listeners to understand that to be eligible for a PD-1 inhibitor for basal cell carcinoma, you actually have had to have failed a hedgehog inhibitor as well. That's important to know. Um, I think the authors of this article and the previous one both provided these clinic care points at the at the uh, end of their articles, which I, as the you know earwax specialist, found to be really really helpful in um, synthesizing the the sort of dense information, important information in each of the articles. Um, so you know we've talked about um, 
basal cell a bit, and we've talked about the various histologies of non melanomatous skin cancer. Um, but um, Kelly, you know, melanoma is still a bad player. So you and uh, Dr. Vivian Wu wrote the article on sentinel node biopsy for head and neck cutaneous melanoma. So, you know, I think that this is another area that's fraught with a little bit of debate or maybe controversy of when do you do a sentinel lymph node biopsy? Um, how accurate is that biopsy going to be? Like, are you going to biopsy the, the good node and, lead, and not biopsy the bad node? Um, and then does it control disease? Like having done this, does it help? So what, are, what is the current events uh, evidence now to support the use of sentinel lymph node biopsies in these patients? Yes, this has definitely been an area that has been fraught with debate and controversy. And even as we have, I think, settled quite a bit of that debate over the years, um, now there are new debates to be had. So this was a really fun chapter to write. Um, to answer your first question about accuracy and safety and impact of sentinel node biopsy, um, we are fortunate to have had large scale multi-institutional studies like um, the multi-center selective lymphadenectomy trial one. Um, we call that MSLT1, and then you'll hear shortly about MSLT2. And these large studies um, have been critical in establishing, you know, the, the safety reliability profile of this procedure. And so looking at MSLT1, what it showed us was that it was really geared to, to demonstrate accuracy of central node biopsy. And it was, it looked at patients, you know, with melanomas of, at all subsites and, um, and demonstrated that about 16% of patients who were randomized to the arm that got sentinel lymph node biopsy had a, had a positive sentinel node. And then the folks that were in the other arm, the wide local excision alone arm, uh, about 15, I think it was 15.6% of those patients eventually developed a positive node. So those numbers, so similar, it, it determined, you know, basically shows us that you can get an accurate sentinel node. You can predict that, that, the, that the node is there, pick it up, remove it, and diagnose it certainly sooner. It also showed that the folks that were observed after a wide local excision alone developed, when they did finally develop lymph nodes and demonstrated their positive node, they tended to have more lymph nodes also. So it indicated disease progression, which really is where um, most of us would argue early sentinel node in the right patients. Um, really makes a difference in terms of um, early and accurate diagnosis, um, staging, and, and actually probably treatment as well. Um, I think the other thing that's really important is that um, MSLT1 showed us that these lymph nodes also have really important prognostic value and that there was a significant improvement in overall survival and melanoma-specific survival in patients who had first of all, a, a negative sentinel node at the time of their intervention. Um, and even between those who had a positive node, comparing them to the patients who had um, a positive node demonstrate more you know, naturally, not having had it picked up in a sentinel node fashion, um, make, you know, having, having your sentinel node identified and excised earlier on had a survival benefit as well. So that's where we really determine that this technique has value, that it's accurate, that it does have a, a great safety profile, and that, um, you know, we should be doing this for the benefit of patients. Now, one of the big criticisms, criticisms of MSLT1 is that it really had a very few head and neck patients in it overall. And this is a constant critique of most of these large scale trials that have occurred over the years. And that'll be true of MSLT2. And also, of, you know, some of the big trials coming out of Europe don't have any head and neck patients in them. So it's something that I think overall, we really have to uh, keep an eye on because we want to make sure that, you know, our patients being counted in these trials, and we're going to have to look in the future as to how to enroll better. But what we wound up doing actually here at Michigan, back in 2012, we published on our own series of just over 350 um, melanoma patients who underwent sentinel node. 
and look at, you know, what can we learn about the accuracy and the safety of this technique. Looking at all those patients, there were really no major, you know, complications of the procedure. So all these concerns about cranial nerves and um, disrupting lymphatics and things like that did not bear out in our sentinel node population here. Um, and moreover, it we also demonstrated that the um, accuracy of the techniques was tremendous. Our um, the negative predictive value of a negative sentinel node is. 95.8%, which really means that only 4.2% of patients are going to recur in the nodal basin, you know, after a, a negative sentinel node. So we go over that with our patients. We make sure that they are self-examining, that they are following up with their dermatologists and, and someone's feeling their neck and their parotid region consistently after a negative sentinel node, but it does demonstrate the tremendous um, accuracy. And our study also continued, you know, as an, another um, study that verified the incredible prognostic value of a of sentinel node that the um, patients that it is the sentinel node is the most important prognostic indicator for patients with melanoma um, bar none higher hazard ratio than anything else in our armamentarium of, of how to advise patients and so really for patients with melanoma unless it is truly a very early you know T1A melanoma, we are offering sentinel node biopsy to those patients in the absence of clinically palpable nodes or evidence of distant disease. Uh, that's, that's amazing. Um, you and Dr. Wu included a lot of information in boxes for readers who go back and read this article. I strongly urge our listeners to do so. Uh, box two looks at the advantages of gamma probe localization I guess, so that you get the best bang for your buck, right? So that you really get the lymph node that you want to get. Um, and box six provides nine aptly titled pearls in uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy technique. So I do urge our listeners to go back to uh, this issue of clinics and take a look at, at that information there. You know, we've talked about sentinel, sentinel node biopsy for melanoma, so Cecilia, let's talk about sentinel node biopsy for non-melanoma skin cancer of the head and neck. And this article was written by doctors Sethi and Emmerich. And so my question is, uh, you know, does what Kelly just said for melanomas hold true for non-melanoma skin cancer in the head and neck in terms of sentinel node biopsy? Sure. So the answer is yes and no. Um, it's yes in that, you know, a walk away from take home point is that sentinel node is standard of care for melanoma. Um, it is also standard of care for Merkel cell carcinoma, which we'll delve into a little bit more um, later on. Um, but the risk of having occult or micrometastatic disease, meaning a patient walks in and you don't palp any, palpate any lymph nodes, you don't see any concerning lymph nodes on a CT scan, for Merkel cell carcinoma, 40% of those patients will actually have regional disease. We know their survival rate drops by 50%, we know they warrant more aggressive treatment. And so certainly the most sensitive and specific way to stage these patients that are clinically N0 for Merkel cell would be sentinel node. Um, when it comes to the other non-melanoma skin cancers, and I would just encourage the readers to, to look at table one, which the authors really nicely outlined, um, for squamous cell carcinoma, we still have a bit more to learn. We do know um, that the false negative rate, meaning you map a nodal basin and the patient winds up being negative but recurs down the road, we know that rate mirrors melanoma. And so that's very exciting because it's considered standard of care in melanoma. Having said that, squamous cell carcinoma doesn't have an overall poor, if you take all comers, as poor of a prognostic factor. So it would be... Um, really cost prohibitive to do a sentinel node on everyone. So we still need to learn who would benefit for squamous cell carcinoma from sentinel lymph node mapping. So I can say in my practice, practice, you know, it's your high risk immunosuppressed patient, some other um, factors that the authors highlight would be a, a T2B um, stage or patients that are poorly differentiated, um, have deeply infiltrative squamous cell carcinomas. And then lastly, um, sebaceous 
uh, carcinoma is a, a rare but another category where one could consider utilizing sentinel node, again, for the most accurate staging. Um, at the end of the day, if your risk of harboring occult nodal disease is 10% or above, that's when you could consider sentinel node. But equally important is it needs to be done, as, as Kelly alluded to, in experienced hands. And it takes an entire team. It's not just the surgeon, it's the nuclear medicine staff, it's the technician that's injecting that radiation radioactive colloid, et cetera. Thank you. I'm Sujana Chandrasekhar. I'm the consulting editor for Otolaryngologic Clinics of North America. And today I'm talking about the April 2021 issue of Otolaryngologic Clinics of North America, which is on head and neck cutaneous carcinoma. And the guest editors uh, and my guests for this podcast are Dr. Cecilia Schmalbach of Temple University and Dr. Kelly Malloy of the University of Michigan. So let's, now that we have ultraviolet rayed our skin and developed our cancer, when do we treat with radiation? So I'm going to turn this to you, Kelly. So there's a very nice article by Dr. Katipali Agarwal and Jaluri looking at radiation therapy for cutaneous malignancies of the head and neck. So we talked about the fact that for the most part, cutaneous malignancy is a surgical disease. So when would there be a role for primary definitive radiation for skin cancer patients? Um, and then when would it be used as an adjuvant? Absolutely. Well, primary radiation is pretty uncommon. Um, for cutaneous malignancies, but there are a few indications where you might want to consider it. Um, for basal cell carcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas, it's really uh, reserved for patients who aren't great surgical candidates. And I'll be honest, I wonder if as we see some of these hedgehog inhibitors roll out, whether or not we will start to risk adjust there as well, because some of these areas that are challenging to resect might be like the medial campus, um, eyelid areas, that sort of thing where sometimes surgery is just really challenging. And so historically, um, radiation might be used there as well. For melanoma, melanoma is a classically um, radio resistant disease. And so really for primary melanoma, it's almost never used, um, but very occasionally for lentigo maligna and lentigo maligna melanoma in the appropriate patient who again is not for some reason a surgical candidate. Um, finally, um, Merkel cell carcinoma in the primary setting, again, very rare. We would still want to resect most of those. But again, if the patient isn't a great surgical candidate, might give that a go. Um, radiation has a much broader potential role in um, the adjuvant setting. And from that perspective, you know, looking at non-melanoma um, cutaneous malignancies, we're looking at using adjuvant radiation in the setting of uh, perineural invasion, neurotropism, where we want to make sure that we're addressing potential roots of local spread. Close or positive margins that can't be surgery for whatever reason, you know, running into a critical structure um, or for recurrence where um, the tumor has recurred and now we want to address a high risk um, primary bed. Uh, we use it in, you know, advanced disease, T3 and T4 disease, as well as um, when we have nodal metastases that meet criteria, usually more than one node and some um, high risk features there. Um, and then as Cecilia mentioned, you know, chronic immunosuppression in these patients is really challenging. And so thinking about using radiation um, in those contexts um, are really important. Um, when we look at melanoma, advanced melanoma surgery, again, it still remains a very radio resistant disease, but we do again use radiation when needed for exactly the same uh, kinds of indications that we saw um, that I just mentioned. Certain subtypes like desmoplastic melanomas, um, close margins, ENI that's ex extensive, those sorts of things. And um, particularly with, um, there's some indications around, you know, having a parotid node to use radiation, um, two or more cervical nodes, and certainly anything that has extra capsular extension would be um, something to consider. But I will say that as we start to talk about some of our systemic therapy developments, even there, um, it's a little bit debatable where to pull where to pull the um, the, uh, the the what's the card that is radiation. You know, when to use it, when's it going to be valuable, and that's where multidisciplinary 
discussion at a, a tumor board with all of the um, oncologist um, specialties, you know, represented is really critical. Finally, for Merkel cell carcinoma, I mean, it's very uncommon for a patient with Merkel cell carcinoma not to get radiation in the adjuvant setting. It's really only very small uh, T1 tumors that, you know, some say even just so long as it's under one centimeter and you have no nodal involvement and no high risk features, maybe you could get away without radiation, but almost everybody else is going to be uh, considered for adjuvant radiation because it's um, such a radio sensitive tumor and has shown really great efficacy in maintaining local regional control for the patients. I just want to take a quick pause here to let our listeners know that they can receive an exclusive discount on the issue we are discussing today by visiting us.elsevierhealth.com slash expert. Thank you. And then you teed up our next uh, topic because we are moving on to systemic therapy. Um, So uh, I think both of you mentioned to me earlier um, before, before we started recording that immunotherapy and targeted therapy are really shifting that conversation around radiation. So in case it wasn't complicated enough, let's make it a little bit more complicated. So we are going to talk about the next two articles, which are the role of systemic therapy in advanced cutaneous melanoma of the head and neck by Drs. Wilson and Fetcher, and the role of systemic therapy in advanced cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck by Drs. Uh, McMullen and Al. So Kelly, I'm going to have you keep talking. So let's talk a little bit about systemic therapy for melanoma. Um, Can you tell us, I I thought that this article was a really terrific primer on the current state of the science and what we should anticipate in the future. Can you give us some highlights about it? Absolutely. Um, I will encourage all of your listeners to dive into this chapter because it is dense and it is, but it's also so clear. It really, you know, defines um, the different pathways and, you know, how we think about these new drugs. And I think the take-home points for us, uh, predominantly a surgical audience, are, are a couple. Um, the gains in survival that we have seen um, in the era of immunotherapy and molecular targeted therapy have been really, like, the big story um, in melanoma and for advanced melanoma um, of the last, you know, decade. Um for diseases in the in the context of you know unresectable advanced melanoma, patients often did not have survi- you know survival expectations that would even make it to a year. And now you know with these looking at five year survival rates that approach fifty and fifty five percent, so it is a huge difference from where we were you know just a few years ago. Um, I think the big take home points are like the two different chunks of of drugs that we're talking about. Sometimes we, as surgeons, will use the term immunotherapy a little bit broadly. And I think what we really want to emphasize is that you have, you know, immunotherapy really refers to checkpoint inhibitors. These are antagonistic antibodies against um, specific um, targets uh, like CTLA-4. That's what um, I always struggle with and how to say all these um, drugs perfectly. And it's always nerve wracking when you're doing it on a podcast, but that's your um, uh, Ipi Lipumab. See, I can't even do it in a, in a concept like this, but then you have your PDL one inhibitors, your PD one inhibitors, uh, Pembrolizumab, Nivolumab. Those are um, all drugs that will then interfere with T cell activation. And what's interesting is, is that, you know, as they started looking at these drugs, um, it does appear that, you know, looking at them in combination is more effective than using them in isolation, but that also will increase their levels of toxicity. And these are um, something that we'll talk about in just a minute, because that's the other thing that I think surgeons need to know is, is, you know, the side effect profiles. Um, On the um, flip side, our molecular targeted therapies are things like BRAF and MEK inhibitors, um, and so those are also um, used in specific instances. But what's really cool is the surgeons were able to actually start to drive some of that conversation. So whenever I have a patient who has a positive sentinel node or, you know, heaven forbid, more distant metastasis, um, I actually send the patient that, that their tumor for um, BRAF analysis up front. So that way we have that information ready 
or even if we're not going to use one of these um, targeted therapies up front, uh, we know that we have it available should the patient need it in the future. So a big pearl for the surgeons is to think about doing that for your patient. I think the other thing that is important for folks to take away from this chapter is what some of these systemic therapies don't know how to use them yet. And I think we're still figuring out their role in adjuvant treatment and potentially in neoadjuvant treatment. I mean, there's groups looking at that, but it isn't quite as clear just yet. And I think um, we all have to think about how to use these agents in a um, collaborative, multidisciplinary fashion. So that way we're, we're thinking about them for the right patients. I think looking at them in an adjuvant, neoadjuvant setting is, is best, you know, considered on a clinical trial and, and bearing that in mind. Um, because the other thing that I think sometimes gets lost in this discussion is around the toxicity of these agents. They are absolutely better tolerated than a lot of our classic chemotherapeutics. However, that does not mean that there aren't significant side effect profiles for these drugs, and they can actually cause quite a bit of harm. So I think bearing that in mind and being familiar with them, these drugs are very hard on bowel, skin, and endocrine systems. And that's where we see the side effects. And because they are drugs that modify you know, the immune system, those are the kinds of things that we see happening um, in these organs as, as toxicities. We see colitis. I've had patients who actually have needed to have bowel resections after or during their treatment. Uh, vitiligo is very common in these patients. And I've seen both thyroid and pancreatic failures. Um, and sometimes these things get better, um, not just if you have a drug holiday, but often have to be treated with high dose steroids as well. But sometimes these things are permanent. And it, so it is really important to bear in mind that as successful as these drugs are, um, they, they too have significant side effect profiles and that we don't want to be looking at these drugs as a substitute for some of our surgical therapies quite yet until we know more. And until we can really, you know, risk adjust with all of the different therapies that we can bring to these patients. I think that, um, really, um, emphasizes the thought process and the multidisciplinary approach that both of you have, um, made sure that we understand is important. Um, Cecilia, let's talk about these same or similar types of therapeutics in advanced cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. Um, anything different to add, different than the melanoma concerns? Yeah, I'm, we are um, starting to see some excited advancements in systemic therapy for squamous cell carcinoma. By no means is it to the point where we um, have progressed in melanoma because they're two different biologies, two different disease entities. So again, just in the way of review and in, in, in this chapter um, that was written by uh, doctors McMullen and O, they did an outstanding job walking us through. So the standard of care for advanced cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, and they define it nicely in the first table, um, is surgery and radiation. And you would think that like mucosal squamous cell carcinoma, that chemo radiation in the adjuvant setting would be helpful. It's really important for our listeners to know that actually the TROG trial did not show a survival benefit when adjuvant chemotherapy was added to traditional radiation. Instead, where we have seen the advancement, and this overlaps beautifully with what Kelly just described, is the PD-1 inhibitors. And so recently in 2018, we saw Smiplumab, FDA approved for, again, the most advanced squamous cell carcinoma, end of the line, the patient has failed traditional surgery or is not a candidate, failed traditional radiation, or is not a candidate. And then you can go um, to Simitlumab, and then more recently, it was Pembrolizumab. Um, this is exciting. We still have a lot to learn. The use of it in the neoadjuvant setting, meaning before surgery, remains to be determined. But um, I will say, I don't think it's going to be exactly the end-all, be-all. And I'm a very positive person, but it's important to understand that when these important clinical trials were published, one needs to understand what the response rate was, and it actually wasn't total cure or response. And in fact, for the original study with Simiplumab, only 4% of those enrolled had a complete response. Um, just under 50% had a partial response, which was fantastic. Um, it's also important to realize that the duration of the response 
61% only saw it for six months. So it is a great alternative that we never had before um, for the recalcitrant squamous cell carcinoma patients, um, but we still have a lot to learn. And the other thing I like to highlight, and this will come up again later on, is that there's still a question of the use in our um, immunosuppressed transplant patients. And so I'm going to use that to hopefully entice you to keep on listening. And I'll talk about that later. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, here too, there's a, a nice box of clinical clinics care points that um, I urge you guys to go back, take a look at the whole issue and look at these sort of very beautifully organized pearls of information that each of these authors has provided. So, you know, we've mentioned that there are other types of skin cancer other than basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma. And there's an article by uh, Drs. Lango and Schneider um, looking at Merkel cell carcinoma uh, and the surgical management of it. And I think we've actually covered a lot of what they say in this article already. So I will just say it's a terrific article and I think people should really read it. We have not touched on uh, cutaneous sarcomas as much. And that article was written by Til Drs. Tillman and Liu. And so, um, Kelly, um, can we talk about this sort of rare cutaneous sarcoma? Um, they're pretty diverse. Um, so are there any pearls when the surgeon is uh, confronted with this as the tumor biology? Absolutely. Um, it is hard to generalize about these um, sarcomas because they are so rare and so different from each other in many ways. However, there are some commonalities in how we address them. One is that almost all of them require really wide margin surgery. And so we're talking, I mean, depending on which ones, at least two centimeters for most of these sarcomas, sometimes three and four centimeters are recommended. Um, thinking about when to, you know, it's very rare that we're getting an MRI for any of these other cutaneous malignancies, but sometimes with some of these sarcomas, that's recommended, particularly if you feel sort of a lower, you know, a deeper element deep, and any kind of degree of fixation on under, you know, underlying tissues. Um, I think the other things that particularly in examples like the atypical fibrosanthoma um, and pleomorphic dermal sarcoma that are kind of on the, the same spectrum, they can mimic the appearance of an amelanotic melanoma. So really thinking about, you know, making sure you get these specimens if, on biopsy to a really expert um, pathologist, dermatopathologist to do the special stains and make sure you know what you're dealing with before you, you plan your surgery. Those sorts of things are the general rules. And I think the other overarching pearl that I would offer is that um, anytime one of these shows up in your clinic, take the time to back up a moment and spend a little time that evening or later that week looking up the current science because it does change time from time to time. And we, none of us sees so many of these that, you know, what you did two years ago is necessarily what you should do now. And I'll give you the example of angiosarcoma where it is still primarily, I think, a surgical disease, all comers, but depending on where you are in your institution, you know, I was all set for surgery. I had done my mapping biopsies because these are classically infiltrative and, and can extend well beyond where the naked eye would um, potentially think that they're going to be. And I was all set for that. And I spoke with one of our, our medical oncologists who's a sarcoma expert. And she said, hold the phone. We wanna do chemo up front. And you know, that's the sort of thing where I couldn't even find anything written about that, but she had just opened a trial. And this is where that, uh, we've said it a thousand times, multidisciplinary approach is really important. So I would say the last pearl on sarcomas is assume nothing always revisit the literature, always revisit the experts, so that way you can plan uh, appropriate care for these patients. I think that's really helpful. Um, I will point out that tables one and two uh, in this article are really useful as they characterize patient population and presentation by tumor type, and table two outlines pathogenesis, histology, and treatment strategy by tumor type. And I think it's a very nice way. As you said, these are really rare. The science is changing. So to wrap your heads, head around how these are presenting. 
I'm Sujana Chandrasekhar. I'm the consulting editor for Otolaryngologic Clinics of North America. And today I'm talking about the April 2021 issue of Clinics, which is on head and neck cutaneous carcinoma with guest editors, Dr. Cecilia Schmalbach of Temple University and Dr. Kelly Malloy of the University of Michigan. So my goodness, Kelly, you talked about two, three, four centimeter margins in the head and neck. So we're talking about some significant um, tracts of land that are missing when there is appropriate tumor extirpation. So let's talk about reconstruction. And we, we started uh, this podcast by talking about the specific ethical and compassionate concerns um, when this is on the most visible portion of a person's body. Um, so Drs. Eid and Aro Serena have written a really nice article on the various reconstruction techniques. So um, can you talk to us about the different skill set that the reconstructive surgeon needs to have so that um, the maximal benefit with the minimal um, uh, you know, donor defect or, or whatever else uh, is achieved. Absolutely. Um, I think broadly speaking, and this chapter demonstrates it's beautiful, just beautifully. I mean, these two surgeons shared so many gorgeous photographs of different options and, and shared a, a real thoughtful approach to a wide variety of defects. I think our reconstructive surgeons have to be prepared to use everything in their toolkit from, you know, a local flap or a skin graft to free tissue transfer. But moreover, they also have to have a, an oncologic eye as well. And, and what I mean by that is, is that, you know, the risk reconstruction is dependent on good cancer control in that bed. And I think that that's important to bear in mind because errors can be made. And that's everything from, you know, receiving the patient from another institution and not knowing exactly where the margin control is, um, you know, there's that story about Ronald Reagan and, and the, the Russian proverb, trust, but verify, you know, trust, but verify is really important in these situations when, you know, you, it's probably worth the time to delay reconstruction while margins are checked, whether it's at your own institution, before you put a beautiful reconstruction up there, you want to make sure that you have final negative path. And a lot of, in a lot of these situations, if the patient's coming from an outside institution, getting that outside pathology here, to review and make sure that you're comfortable um, with the, the oncologic quality of your defect. Um, I think function and form are obviously the things that most reconstruction, most reconstructive surgeons look at as, you know, what they're taxed with and what their ethical burden is, as you put it. And really, you know, thinking, I would say my pearls there are, I really like to quote that they used in this article, replace losses in kind, think about similar kinds of soft tissue, skin quality, skin color match, bony support, and how you achieve that. And that. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really important to bear in mind is that the patient themselves is really critical here. And as much as they want the best reconstruction possible, we also sometimes have to look at what they're, how they're able to partner with us. And, you know, some of our patients are older and firm, have limited ability to participate in their wound care. So really figuring out strategies that are going to work for them and also get them a great result is really important. So, you know, when we usually in these talks about reconstruction, we're talking about the reconstructive ladder, and that's always very helpful. But at the same time, the ladder isn't linear. And so you might have to go up a rung, down a rung, you know, think about um, different options based on what the patient is really presenting you, both from their health you know, characteristics as well as that, that defect itself. Thank you. Um, so Cecilia, we have mentioned the word immunosuppressed a million times. So let's talk about these head and neck cancers of the skin in these high risk immunosuppressed populations. And you wrote this article with Dr. Choi. Um, so, you know, we're talking about people who have had, let's say, solid organ transplants, and they are sort of chronically and profoundly immunosuppressed. So they don't do as well with these tumors as do their immunocompetent counterparts. 
So how do you, as not only the surgeon, but as a member of the team that's taking care of these patients, how do you um, get skirt the issue of their immunocompromise to get them their best outcome? Yeah, it's, um, it's humbling. So our transplant, solid organ transplant population in particular, their risk of cutaneous cancers, usually it's cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma is 250 times greater than the general population. And so I will share that in the past 10 years of my career, this has been my focus because I was tired of watching patients live for 17 years with their heart transplant to die of their scalp skin cancer that was eroding through their calvarium into their brain. And it's iatrogenic. We're causing it from the immunosuppression with the best of intention, obviously. So in these folks, it's, it comes down to awareness. That's really important for the patient and their families, really important for the, the care team, the primary care team, the dermatologist, et cetera. Um, these are folks that we follow a lot more closely. It's not just once a year check, um, especially for head and neck, I will see them every three months for quite some time. They can recur as late as 10 years afterwards. Um, one of the pearls would be to definitely dialogue with the transplant team to ensure that they are on the lowest level of immunosuppression where they won't have organ rejection, but hopefully they won't keep developing these life-threatening cutaneous cancers. Um, these are patients surgically, I'll be a bit more regressive. Uh, when we look at the, the guidelines for margins, I'm going to err towards the upper end of what's recommended. I mentioned earlier, uh, these are patients that I'll have a low threshold to do a sentinel node biopsy on if they don't have any nodal disease. Um, and then the last thing that I will share, you know, one of the challenges is that the patients that would benefit most from these exciting systemic therapies aren't eligible. And I say that, in, and if you look at it, the risk of fulminant rejection of an organ, transplant organ uh, in the setting of simiplumab is 50%. And what could argue well for a kidney, you can go back on dialysis, though many patients would rather die than be wed to dialysis again, but there's not a whole lot of backup for that heart or that liver, et cetera. There's some case studies and we still have a lot more to learn about how we can utilize the PD-1 inhibitors in these transplant patients. And the, the last point I'll make, and Kelly highlighted this earlier, when she talked about melanoma is you have to read the clinical trials closely. And the majority of transplant patients are actually excluded from all of the PD-1 inhibitor trials. And again, it's just having that knowledge. Um, that's really important. Uh, you know, as we continue further, uh, the next article is by doctors Ovite, Hugh, Hughley, and uh, McCammon. And um, this is really looking at ethical considerations for elderly patients with these cutaneous malignancies. Um, and uh, I think in particular, many of us as surgeons don't really understand palliative surgical care and palliative otolaryngology. Um, it's really um, bizarrely heartwarming to learn more about palliative care because it's truly the confluence of ethics and science and compassion, taking the patient and their family's uh, wishes um, uh, into strong consideration. So um, can you tell us what is the concept of narrative ethics and how do you use that to approach uh, to approach these patients? Yeah, this was fascinating. And I will confess that I had not heard the term before. So I learned quite a bit in editing and reviewing and reading this chapter. So certainly the foundation of um, ethical care when we treat patients are, you know, the four tenets of beneficence, non-maleficence, uh, autonomy, and justice. But the reality is those you can think about as core values related to the patient, him or herself. But then you need to really take a step back. And I see the narrative ethics as just the reality, the global holistic picture. And what it's describing is the narrative, the experience, for example, of the patient and what the patient has been through, talking a bit more personally about, well, what are the care goals? What is quality of life? Are they more interested in duration 
being pain free, but it goes beyond the individual patient, because especially with this elderly cutaneous cancer population, there's a caregiver team, it's often a family member or members, and what is their narrative and their experience, and in a very supportive way, their um, role comes into play in this joint decision making. And then lastly, the authors do a great job of discussing the fact that there's the surgeon's narrative. And, you know, we have our own experiences, and it's interesting, they could be conscious and unconscious. But all of those experience, I like to think in a really neat way, um, are, are knitted together to help the patient and their family decide what is best in ultimately treating the patient. And it's obviously going to be different for each uh, individual. You know, I'm going to cross uh, pollinate. So I do this podcast for clinics and I love it. I also have a show called She's on Call, which is a video show, but you don't have to look at me. You could just listen to those podcasts too. We did a show on palliative care on July 18th of uh, 2021 uh, with Dr. Melissa Red Hoffman and Dr. Amrita Krishnan. Um, and I actually, and it's very funny because Dr. Hoffman and Susan McCammon know each other very well. Um, and it was very nice to sort of um, be, be uh, you know, connected to, to different uh, approaches to healthcare. But I thought it was going to be like the most depressing show I had done on She's on Call. And I must say, based on a lot of what you're saying, a lot of what's in this article, it's really the most uplifting article, uh, uh, uplifting show that we did, just left us feeling the way we did when we chose to go into medical school and we chose to be healers, not just surgeons, not just radiation oncologists, not just medical doctors, but actually healers. So um, there you go, there's my plug. So let's move along um, and let's talk about injectables. So we've talked about systemic therapies, we've talked about surgery, we've talked about radiation, um, we've talked about all the mizumabs and zizumabs and all the mabs that there are. Um, where is the role for injectables in head and neck cutaneous melanoma? And this article was written by Dr. Romanchik and Mark. So um, Kelly, how do they work? What, what are they? What, what, when do we offer those? Thank you. Yeah, they're kind of an interesting subset of therapy. And historically, they incorporate things like even tumor vaccines. Um, but the modality that the chapter focuses on and the one that um, is, you know, most well known and clinically relevant right now is TVEC. And this is um, an FDA approved live attenuated type one herpes simplex virus that the attenuation has really been around um, making it selectively virulent to cancer cells and downgrading the virulence for, for normal cells, which is really important if you're gonna be injecting a virus that's cancer directed, it better direct to cancer cells. Um, and what happens is, is that attenuation is about deleting and inserting different genes that um, increase the oncolytic potency of this uh, modality. And, um, and really give it tumor selective virulence. So it's, it's pretty neat. Um, and what it does is after injection, it induces an immune response, um, release of GM CSF, which you know, heightens the immune response to the tumor. Um, and it strengthens both local and systemic tumor response. So what's really kind of cool about this is while you may be injecting, um, a, a lesion, a cutaneous lesion, say a, a large dermal metastasis, what you will likely see in many patients response elsewhere. So in potentially even a distant metastasis, but certainly um, in other, um, you know, often when we see dermal metastases and showering of and transit metastases, there's lots of little melanoma sort of little lumps and in, up in, in a sort of aggressive local pattern. Um, this TVEC can be used, you know, as monotherapy, it can be used in combination therapy with some of our other, you know, the systemic therapies that we talked about, those are still really under investigation. Um, but the, the application of this is really in patients, um, with 
unresectable or what I would probably call more like um, surgically uncontrollable melanomas. And so that's where you've already operated. The patient has um, dermal metastases that are really very difficult to control and they're becoming innumerable and clinically apparent. And um, really the surgery is just not going to get them where they need to go. And so this is a neat modality to be able to um, induce an immune response to start to try to control some of that disease, uh, both in the local field as well as more systemically. So, you know, I think you made a point that um, not no single uh, surgeon or site has a lot of experience with this um, additional modality. So I wonder, Cecilia, if you can talk to us about your uh, understanding and experience of these injectables. Yeah, well, I'm, I was so fortunate. Um, Lawrence Mark was one of my former colleagues when I was at Indiana University. And it really takes someone, and he's brilliant, someone who's willing to um, spearhead either the clinical trial or the initiative. So it's interesting. He's a dermatologist by trade. Sometimes it'll be an oncologist, sometimes a head and neck surgeon. So uh, similar to what Kelly um, said, just echoing her point, TVAC is the one that... Um, I was most familiar with, I think also some of the IL-2 agents as well. Um, but these are to be used um, definitely in the setting of a multidisciplinary tumor board. So a lot just depends on the patient population and the access to, to the drug, if you will. You know, um, I, as I was reading through this article, I told you guys, I end up reading every issue like three times. You would think I'd be a lot smarter than I am. But uh, I was reading through and um, uh, table five in this article shows the recommended dosing ratio of injection volume to lesion size. And I think that's uh, rather important. And then figure two shows radial injection techniques, which are a little different, whether it's a cutaneous lesion, a subcutaneous lesion or a nodal lesion. So I recommend that the listeners go back and take a look at those as well. And so this issue of clinics concludes with the role of nose surgery uh, in cutaneous head and neck cancer by Dr. Gina Jefferson. So let's talk about nose surgery. It was first described in the 1930s by Dr. Frederick Mose, and he called it chemosurgery, which preserved as much normal tissue as possible. And one of the hallmarks of Mose um, is that their micrographic sectioning, so the dermatology sectioning is really very different than the routine sort of bread loafing, uh, so-called bread loafing that we see when we cut through tumors to see margins or to see depths of disease. So um, uh, it's really a very different technique. I, I like the figures in this article, um, but Kelly, uh, Mose is often accepted as a first-line treatment for most basal and many squamous cells of the head and neck. So what are the limitations of Mose for these tumors? And when would you pivot from a Mose technique uh, to conventional surgical resection? I think for really the majority of basal cell carcinomas, we're probably looking at a Mohs technique is gonna be the best way forward for all the reasons you just mentioned. Um, but occasionally those will um, be beyond Mohs, you know, when they're really locally aggressive and eroding into, you know, cartilages and bone and, and whatnot where, um, and some of those are the same instances also that we're thinking about, you know, what other approaches we might wanna take into consideration, whether it's, um, upfront Vismotajeb or other, you know, that, that multidisciplinary discussion. But I think for the majority of basal cells you're, that are sort of run of the mill, Mohs is going to be a great technique. And that's probably true for um, a lot of the squamous cell carcinomas as well. Cecilia mentioned that a lot of cutaneous malignancy is, is that which we never see in a head and neck or otolaryngology office. Um, so I think sometimes we get a biased view as to, you know, what's appropriate and what isn't. So I, I think we have to start off by saying that. Um, but there are instances, particularly cell carcinomas, that I think we need to be careful. And, and MOS can be really wonderful, to, you know, in experienced hands to address some high risk, risk features like um, 
perineural invasion and being able to follow that and really be more confident about clearing it. But in extensive tumors, and, and I've certainly had the experience with some of my referring most surgeons who are wonderful most surgeons, but when they have tagged, you know, the spinal accessory nerve or the facial nerve, <laughs> that's, that's where their positive margin is, you know, you do wonder about, you know, the, the conversation there and how we could have potentially done better. So, and that's hard to predict. This isn't to lay blame at anyone's feet, but it's just hard to predict. So I think to the degree that you can, you know, palpate depth and think about, you know, other nearby structures that a head and neck surgeon might be in a better position to help with, those sorts of plans are really important. And then I think what Cecilia just reviewed um, related to our thoughts around nodal disease. And so when we are going to be doing an investigation of potential nodal metastasis via sentinel node biopsying, um, I think there we should really be performing a, a more classic wide local excision at the time of the sentinel lymph node biopsy because doing MOS in advance um, could, could potentially disrupt the lymphatics. Um, doing a sentinel lymph node biopsy without excising the primary sometimes is fraught with inaccuracies because the um, the radioactivity produces shine through and then we can't find the nodes. So really, I think trying to think about um, when to pivot towards a wide local excision approach is, is really important. I think the other thing that was really important about this chapter is, is you know, does MOS have a role in melanoma? And I, some people are, um, I've worked with colleagues at different institutions who are actively investigating that and, and, and feel that they can do that accurately. But in general, it's still, we're lacking evidence that this is a consistent and high quality approach um, for a couple of reasons. Um, melanocytes are difficult to assess on you know, the frozen section technique. There's disruptions um, of the actual tissue that make it really difficult to assess um, those melanocytes. We have to use special stains like MART1 and you know, all the other ones that, you, that you've learned in, in you know, preparing for your boards, um, Melanie and S100, those are really hard to do during most surgery when you have a lot of them to do. And, um, and again, you're working with frozen tissue. Um, and I think the other thing that MOS will impacts, you, you can't get a good Breslow depth. And there goes part of your prognostic value of your procedure and, and your staging. And that's really important as well. Um, and finally, you know, just putting into the same context of what I just said around so many of our melanomas are going on to, you know, we're going to be doing a central node at the same time. It doesn't make sense to be, um, staging those procedures or particularly when we don't have evidence that, that most is going to give us a, a benefit on the oncologic resection side. Well, thank you. Um, we have reached the end of the articles on head and neck cutaneous cancer. Uh, the April 2021 issue of clinics also contains two articles in the series, Intentionally Shaping the Future of Otolaryngology, which were guest edited by Dr. Jennifer Vilwak. Uh, the articles in the April 2021 issue are on mentorship and sponsorship in a diverse population by Dr. Uh, Christina cabrera Muffley and increasing the number of black otolaryngologists by Drs. O'Brien, Daus, Bayan, Stucken, and Von Abel. So I love that series as well. Um, very different than the sort of uh, hardcore cancer discussion we've just had. Um, the, I've urged our listeners to read those articles and the podcast covering Dr. Vilwak's entire series, which began in the August 2020 issue and ended in the August 2021 issue of Clinics is available at odo.theclinics.com or wherever you get your podcasts. So I'm Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar. I want to thank you so much the guest editors of the April 2021 issue of Otolaryngologic Clinics of North America, which is on head and neck cutaneous cancer. Uh, Dr. C Cecilia Schmalbach is the David Myers Professor and Chair of the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. She's Director of the Head and Neck Institute at Temple University, and she is based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She is also the editor-in-chief elect of the journal Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, which is the official journal of the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. Dr. Kelly Malloy is Associate Professor of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at the University of Michigan Medical School. 
She's Program Director of the Head and Neck Surgical Oncology and Microvascular Reconstruction Fellowship and Associate Chief Clinical Officer of Surgical and Rehabilitative Services at University Hospital of Michigan Medicine, and she is based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thank you both so much, Cecilia and Kelly. I am honored to call you my friends and my colleagues, and I want to thank you for all the work you put in, in making this edition of clinics so comprehensive. Thank, thank you. you. This is great. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Otolaryngologic Clinics Podcast. For an exclusive discount on the issue we discussed today, focusing on head and neck cutaneous cancer, visit us.elsevierhealth.com slash expert. Otolaryngologic Clinics is available for individual print subscription with accompanying online access or individual online only access and is also available on the Elsevier electronic platforms, Clinical Key and Science Direct. For more information on this series and our nearly 60 other titles spanning all medical disciplines, visit info.theclinics.com. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and subscribe to the Otolaryngologic Clinics podcast on Apple Podcasts and Google Play.